Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is Luke Wilson from Dell EMC. He is the AI research lead at their HPC and AI Innovation Lab. Luke, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me on, Rich. Well, Luke, I, I was really glad to get a hold of you today, uh, right in time for supercomputing. You've got a fascinating topic here, brain decoding using neural networks to read minds. Oh, what do you mean by that? So this is a project that we've been working on. Um, it's actually run out of McGill University, uh-huh. uh, but in collaboration with us and Intel and the Montreal Neurological Institute. What they're trying to do is decipher fMRI activation maps. I don't know if you've ever sat in an, uh, for an fMRI, but basically they put you inside an MRI machine and then they have you perform a task, like hold a pencil or pick up a cup uh, or think about what you had for breakfast. And then they take an image of which regions of the brain are activated, which ones are receiving the most blood flow, where the most chemical activity is. Uh, and then they associate that a activation map with the task you were performing. And the goal of this project is to reverse that mapping. So given an image of a, of a activated brain, can we determine what the patient was being asked to do at that time? So the, the first goal is, of course, to build this, this catalog, this understanding of how the brain activates to perform different tasks. And the idea here is that once we have this understanding of how these activation maps relate to the tasks being performed, uh, we can then look at all sorts of different tasks or if different tasks have coordinated regions. Do they share regions of the brain? You know, so if two different tasks that seem unrelated share portions of that neuron area, the end goal would be to then figure out how the brain is able to do that context switch. How can it use the same set of neurons to do two completely different tasks? Whereas artificial neural networks right now only understand how to do one thing at a time. You can't have the same neural network performing two different tasks simultaneously. So the way we apply AI, it's very, it's, it's a single purpose kind of thing, unlike the brain, which is multitasking? Yeah, exactly. So artificial neural networks, of course, first discussed and, you know, first crudely put together back in the 1950s and 1960s, but were meant as a way of helping us understand the human brain. We were hoping to figure out what intelligence was by replicating that connection system in a computer to see if we could replicate some of the same capabilities that we have that we as humans consider intelligence um, in a machine. And that process continues on. You know, the use of neural networks is not just about you know, finding dogs, cats, and sandwiches in pictures off the internet. The end goal is really to figure out what makes humans intelligent and then if we can impart some of that intelligence to the system itself. So are you trying to build better uh, neural networks as a result of this? Exactly. So the, yeah, the end goal would be to build better neural networks. If we can figure out how to reuse areas of artificial neural networks in the same way that areas of the brain are reused for other tasks, then we can make our artificial neural networks much more modular. We can use, you know, kind of a building block approach to them where we can swap out parts or use the same part in multiple tasks or connect multiple sets of inputs to multiple internal regions of, of the neural network so that it can simultaneously perform multiple tasks. That makes them smaller, that makes them more efficient, uh, and it could potentially make them more capable. Because I know I've experienced this. I'm sure everyone else has experienced this. You know, you s smell a flower or you smell a, a pie cooking, and then all of a sudden it triggers something else in your mind. And that's because of the interconnected nature of, of our brains, because we're using the same sets of neurons for multiple tasks, either motor control, um, sensory input, or memory recall. Well, Luke, can you kind of characterize, you know, the amount of data and, and what you guys were challenged with? All right. So this initial project is kind of a, a first step in this, in this long goal of figuring out how to um, reuse sections of neural networks and artificial neural networks. The first task was looking at, at the human brain, of course. And uh, the folks at McGill started with 
this data set from the Human Connectome Project. Uh, so this data set has data from 1,200 different patients, and each patient had 500 hours of data collected on them. So it was 500 total hours of brain scans while these patients are performing different tasks. So the, these tasks range from simple things, like I mentioned, picking up a pencil or holding a cup, to recalling what you had for breakfast or being asked a, a specific technical question, for example, like how many days is, are in a year or how far away is Earth from the sun. So the goal is that with this data set, we now have this collection of data, some 60,000 hours of data of brain scans that are associated with the tasks that the patients were performing uh, at the time the scan was taken. So can we then reverse the process and use this as a training data set to read in the image and then guess what the task was that was being performed by the patient at the time, essentially reading the patient's mind. Now, let me just talk a little bit more about um, McGill's challenges real quick. So the data set is very large. Obviously, you know, these are not very low-resolution images, and, and they have at first started by trying to train neural networks to do this on GPU. And the problem they noticed is that most of the, the work they were having to do with these images was before they even got to the neural network. They had to do an enormous amount of image preprocessing. The, the feature maps were very large. So they ended up with these large stall times on the GPUs waiting for the CPUs to perform all this preprocessing work. So they decided instead to look at the problem a different way. Instead of using the GPUs to accelerate the part of the problem that was already relatively fast, why not just do all of the neural network training straight on the, on the CPUs? Can we do it on Intel CPUs um, where we're doing the image preprocessing already and get better time to solution overall than using the GPUs in concert with CPUs? And to do that, they used Zenith here at the Dell EMC HPC and AI Innovation Lab. Zenith is our largest engineering and uh, evaluation cluster built entirely out of Intel Xeon Scalable Processors. The majority of it is currently Intel Xeon Scalable Gold 6248, packaged in the Dell EMC PowerEdge C6420 dense compute platform, which is our 2U four-node sled design that allows for four independent compute nodes with independent networking in a 2U chassis. And what they did was use Intel Optimized TensorFlow version 1.11 with Intel's Deep Neural Network Library. Uh, it used to be called MKLDNN, now called DNNL, and Horovod to parallelize the training. And, and they looked at two different neural network topologies, a custom convolutional neural network that consisted of several layers of convolution followed by some pooling, and then a stock ResNet 50, you know, the, the same topology that everyone uses to benchmark the, the performance of, of their systems for deep learning. So the result was that they were able to build these extremely accurate mappings from images to actions. Uh, I think w one of the things that, that was discovered over the course of this process was that the, mapping, the, the mappings themselves were actually very concrete. There wasn't a lot of ambiguity in them. We were, very, we were able to very easily detect which activation maps corresponded to which actions. In fact, for motor tasks, the model constructed was 99% accurate on the validation test after 10 epochs. And the working memory task, where you're trying to recall a fact or an event, was 91% accurate um, after 20 epochs. And it really did not take very much time to do this. On 20 Intel Xeon Scalable Gold 6248 processors, it took 20 minutes to train these particular neural networks versus three hours on two... NVIDIA P100 GPUs, which the, the research team at McGill had in their lab already. And, and so because of the availability of CPUs in comparison to GPUs, you know, the, 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 the thing about GPUs is they're great. They accelerate a ton of workloads. They can really reduce the time to solution, but sometimes it's hard to get a hold of them. Um, they're usually the most heavily requested resources in a data center. They're hard to get a hold of, but CPUs are everywhere. And so if you can train on CPUs using a little bit of scale-out parallelism and, uh, and you're already doing a lot of heavy image preprocessing on the CPUs anyway, uh, you can just stay on the CPU and, and get better results, better time to solution 
uh, without having to take that extra step. So you have an abundant resource in the CPUs, right? Because of servers, there's cloud, there's all kinds of things. But the GPUs is kind of a rare resource for accelerating workload. So this, they can get a lot more work done, looks like to me, in a, in a short order. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the end goal is if you want to make more breakthroughs, you know, if you're, if you're a research group and you're trying to make that next scientific breakthrough, that time to solution matters. Say, for example, you could get 5% better performance using an accelerator. If, if it takes more time to get a hold of that resource, it may not be uh, as efficient. And in this case, the CPUs themselves were actually far more efficient uh, because of the amount of image prairie processing that had to be done to prepare these fMRI activation maps for classification through the neural network. So, Luke, you know, this is fascinating research. Uh, were there any kind of aha moments? I mean, things like, uh, are all brains the same? Do they have the same locality for, for tasks? Or what, what kind of uh, insights are they going to get from this? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not really sure what the, uh, the results were in terms of if there were any real interesting biological <laughs> insights that, were, that, were, that came about from this. Yeah. Um, but I do know that, of course, uh, every successful AI project begets two more AI projects. So the team at McGill is ready to kind of move on to the next step, which is looking at collecting more data on different tasks. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you're really thinking about what's next for, for this project, it's they want to collect data on people playing video games, which I know sounds kind of, in, kind of strange, but... Video games are one of the, the most complex tasks that, that we perform. It requires coordination of a lot of different neurological capabilities. You're doing strategy, planning, motor control, visual processing that's happening. Uh, so there's a lot of different components that are all working in concert with one another. And this is why a lot of AI research is focused on playing games, because playing games is the simplest, clearest analog we have to the more complex things that we eventually want AI to do in the real world, such as driving cars, flying planes, uh, making real-time decisions about the environment that it lives in. Uh, we can simulate all of that through the playing of games. So what McGill wants to do is they want to have patients play games inside the MRI machine. <laughs> Yeah, because they can do it from one place, not like driving a car or something. They can be there next to the equipment doing all these complex tasks. Exactly. And uh, I don't know if you've ever cracked open a video game controller, but it's usually full of magnetizable metals, uh, which don't really play well inside of an MRI machine. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 the researchers have actually already developed, they've already built it. They've built a specially designed game controller that is made of plastic and non-magnetic metals so mm -hmm. that patients can play video games while, while laying down in the imager and not have the game controller ripped out of their hands uh, by the MRI machine. So, so that's the next step. Yeah, yeah. Well, well Luke, you know, it, it's really interesting to hear case studies like this out of the, the Dell uh, HPC Innovation Lab uh, you know, I've, I've been there, you've got this whole array of equipment that a lot of people might not have access to, and you've got a lot of people with know-how on how to apply it, such as cases like this. Exactly. We've got, we've got a, a fairly large data center here, uh, 13,000 square feet of data center space. We hold multiple large-scale evaluation clusters. Zenith is our flagship system. It's the, the only system we have on the top 500 list. I believe in the, the June 2019 list, we came in at 392 or 393, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. um, just over a petaflop of peak performance. And, um, but we have other systems as well. We have a, a GPU-accelerated system that gives customers and uh, collaborators access to the latest NVIDIA uh, GPUs. We uh, now have a brand-new uh, AMD Roam system uh, built on uh, our... C6525 platform, so it's uh, two socket uh, ROM uh, nodes, all connected by the latest HDR InfiniBand from Mellanox. Uh, so there's a lot of 
interesting systems in the lab that people can play with. We, we touch anything that ever goes into a data center. So we look at processors, we look at GPUs, we look at uh, FPGAs, we look at FPGAs from Intel and from Xilinx. So, so there's a whole array of hardware we look at uh, for, for an array of different problems. Well, great, Luke. You know, this has been a, a very interesting case study, and I want to thank you for uh, coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Rich. I really appreciate it. Okay, you bet. All right, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.